Yes, everything's Fine. perfect. Okay. All right, so let me just, hi, Guy. It is so nice to see you, and hi. I'm such a fan of your work. And um, just a little background on Guy Kawasaki, for those of you who don't, don't know, he um, is a phenomenal influencer in the entrepreneurial community and all of the ecosystems. And he started at Apple, like you're an Apple guy. Um, he left Apple after having quite an impact. He has written 10 million books, I believe, and I've read them all. Enchantment is my favorite because I have a signed copy, right? So Guy and I know we have known each other um, for, for a while. And his work right now, like you're, you're, you've got a podcast, Remarkable People, which I binged. I totally binged it last night. Um, and for those of you who have, who have not listened to Remarkable People, you, you really should because there, there has never been a time that is more important um, for the message of Guy Kawasaki than right now in the history of, of our world and kind of where we are and how we're trying to scrap and how we're you know trying to figure out how to be startups and how to be innovative and how to be, be creative and you know, your work has always, um, it's inspired a lot of people, but it, it has really, you know, I have some quotes I want to talk to you about. Am I leaving anything out? Like your, your, your body of work is absolutely, like, I, we don't have enough time. Like, I can't, like, actually go through all of it. Um, but you have this wonderful podcast, and, like, you know, I just discovered it last night. And if you guys have not listened to Remarkable People, go do it. And there's one particular um, episode that I want to kind of hone in on, if you don't mind. Um, but first of all, talk us through how you got from Apple to where you are now, like you, you, you inspire people every single day with the words that you write, with your Twitter account, with your podcast. Like, how, how did you get from there to here? How did that work? Well, it was totally random, totally <laughs> unplanned. I, I was a software evangelist at Apple. I left that to start a company. I returned to Apple. Uh, I left Apple again. If I had not left Apple either of those two times, it, you know, that's a few hundred million right there. And then I I started companies, and now I am a podcaster, and I'm the chief evangelist of Canva and a Mercedes-Benz brand ambassador. So those are the three hats that I primarily wear. And, I, you know, I wish I could tell you I had a plan to go from point A to point B to point C to point D. There was no plan. Basically, I fell in love with stuff. I took a podcasting in December of 2019 and just happened to love it. I don't think I'll ever write another book. I think podcasting is the superior mechanism to get the word out. So, yeah, so that's uh, that's what I do. I'm 65 years old. So, Amy, I've had a long time to do stuff. I mean, OK, so I'm going to ask this. Your hair mm -hmm. looks fantastic. Are you cutting it yourself? <laughs> Well, partially, actually, yeah. my, wife, my <laughs> wife, my wife cuts my hair now because you know you can't get a haircut, right. and just you know twenty five dollar clippers and off she goes. And yeah. I happen, I have to confess, the reason why I signed or tried to sign on at eight fifty nine was because I was surfing. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I knew that that that's the other thing about Guy Kawasaki is that he is not just a book writer and a podcaster. He's an adventurer. And I, I think that part of your life really comes through in your work. Um, and, you know, like I, I have these questions for you. So, you know, you have this book called Wise Guy, right? Yes. And you, I'm assuming you are Wise Guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> And you have these beautiful quotes, and I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. So um, when losing your job feels like losing yourself, talk to me about that, because right now, where we are in history, that is a profound question. So talk, talk us through that. Well, hopefully, uh, when you lose your job, it does not affect your self uh, image and self confidence and all that. Uh, particularly now, I mean, maybe in boom times and you lose your job, you'd really have to ask, you know, why am I the only person in the world who lost his job? 
but now when 25 or 30 percent of the people are going to lose their job you just have to decouple the fact that yeah. you may be entirely competent and intelligent and all the good stuff but listen you know if if people aren't going into stores and people can't shop and people can't do this and you know if you're a if you're a meeting planner for Hewlett Packard and Hewlett Packard is not having any more in-person meetings for the rest of 2020. So they don't need an exhibit manager. Well, you know, that has nothing to do with you. It's not your fault that there's a pandemic. And what do you, so, I mean, the, the times are challenging and, you know, not just in the United States, but, but, but globally. And, you know, I, 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 we talked about this on, on email the other day. I, I interviewed some people who were like, yay, optimism, opportunities are, are right in front of you. Um, and some people are dour. Like even, you know, old school entrepreneurs are just kind of in a bad mood. And so what is your advice to like get getting over this, this hump? Like how do you identify opportunities? What, like what, what should we be doing? Well, first of all, you know, whenever I read or see people talking about this kind of subject, I always say to myself, well, that's easy for him to say, or that's easy for her to say she's worth $5 billion and has uh, okay. her nanny. Her name, okay. right? So there's that. So I, I hope I'm not accused of that. Uh, I, I don't think there's a magical solution. Uh, no. So it, it's going to take, the, it's, it's going to be, you know, I tell people to run the right race. And the right race is not a 100-meter dash or a 100-yard dash. The right race is a marathon. So this could go on for months or and months or even years. And so I think mentally you have to get that in your mind that you know, if, if you believe that there's a vaccine coming in January and in February everything's going to be back to normal, I, I have a bridge to sell you right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think it takes the right man mentality. I'm not, I'm not pessimistic in the sense that I think the world will end, but I'm not, you know, delusionally optimistic that the the world will recover in January. So right now, my advice to most small business and entrepreneurs is that you know run the right race, uh, understand that cash is king. So it, 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 let's say you're a consumer goods company, and you're sitting on this inventory, and you're saying, well. You know, should I discount my inventory and just blow it out, turn the inventory into cash? Or should I maintain this sort of brand image that we're highly exclusive? Should I continue to work with my channel partners or should I sell direct to consumers through Instagram? Honestly, my recommendation is cash is king. Turn your inventory into cash and sell direct because I, I know companies where much of their business went through Amazon. And Amazon decided that their category isn't, quote, essential. So what are you going to do? Uh, I, I think you know, a year from now, two years from now, whenever it ends, you can be in two sort of positions. One position is you're alive and maybe Amazon and your channel partners are beating you up. They're going to say, well, you know, during the pandemic, you sold direct. You, you bypassed the tier distribution. You, you know, you cut our margin, blah, blah, blah. Or you're dead. And between those two choices, guess what? It's better to be alive and people are complaining that you sold direct, you know, do, did all this kind of stuff. You discounted a lot. Um, cash is king. So you're, you're, you're cheating <laughs> because what right. you're talking about right now is the art of uh, perseverance, which is one of your yeah. podcast topics, which I – I loved it. I thought it was so relevant. And so you have 11 points, right? Like 11 hit points in this podcast. And I wrote them down because I, I was so moved by them and they are so useful, especially right now, right? Like we can, we can all be Pollyanna and we can all be, you know, rah-rah for entrepreneurs and for creatives and innovators. Uh, but the practicality I think that you set forth, especially in this, like this guy, this podcast was fantastic. Like if, if you haven't listened to the art of perseverance, you need to go listen to it. There are 11 points. They are so salient and so easy. And, um, you know, they, they fly in the face of what's going on. Am I, am I right? Well, you're too kind. And 
Listen, I'm not there, there, crying. I'm not there, crying at all. <laughs> there's two. There's two versions of this this podcast. So one version is at Remarkable People, and yeah. that's kind of a audio only. And then one day I decided, well, let's just see how hard it is to make a video. So I made a video, and that's on YouTube. If you went to my YouTube channel, uh, there's the Art of Perseverance YouTube video, which was done after the podcast, which I think is better than the podcast I because it had the benefit of- I didn't do the video. I didn't do the video. I'm so sorry. Um, no, no. I, I loved the podcast. And so these 11, you know, these 11, first of all, let me just ask you one, one other question, a quote from one of your books. And also you just tweeted this recently. Um, the opposite of success isn't failing, it's learning. Yes. Tell, tell me about that. Yes. So, you know, uh, I think just mathematically or statistically or realistically, the bulk of things that people try, whether it's a company or a product or service or career, uh, you're going to fail. So yeah. yep. knowing that, then you have to, you know, wrap your mind around failure. So one thing you can do from a failure is learn so that you can fail less or fail more slowly or not fail at all the next time. It really, it really is a crying shame to waste a good failure. Yeah. And so yeah. That, that's my message. Now, I will say that there's this body of thought that it's okay to fail, you know, fail quick and get it out there. And if you fail and all that, it's no big deal. Just keep pivoting and all that. I don't believe in that either. Uh, I think it is a big deal to fail and you should do everything you can to not fail and you should not waste people's money and you should not waste people's time. So it's not okay to just cavalierly fail. But if you do fail, at least, learn something so that you fail, as I said, slower or smaller or not fail at all the next time. So, okay, before uh, before we get into the art of perseverance, so the, the topic of failure, all right, for, for you and for me, right, like you're Silicon Valley, you've been through the whole Silicon Valley thing, and mm -hmm. failure is sort of a badge of accomplishment, right? Like it's like you wear... Uh -huh. I mean, there, there's a there's a conference in Silicon Valley called FailCon, right? Yeah. So, talk to me about what like well, failure, like yeah. how, how it, and it's it's a newer topic, especially in places like Turkey and yeah. Scandinavia. Like failure is not like it is not at all embraced, but we embrace yeah. it. What? Why? Like, if, what, like if you, what the hell is that? Okay, this is this is a very nuanced topic, right? So. If you're outside of Silicon Valley and you read that, you know, Entrepreneur or Inc. or Fast Company or Wired or Verve or TechCrunch writes an article that says it's okay to fail. So you're yeah. out there, you're yeah. in Istanbul and you read that, you say, oh, it's okay to fail. You know what? Um, it's not okay to fail. And so, as I say, you know, you should do everything you can not to fail. But if you do fail, is probable then at least learn and and you know fight the good fight and so this the concept that failure is a badge of courage is bullshit i mean i totally agree with you like i i hate failing i mean do you like feeling i don't like it it feels really bad and i feel like shit when i fail i mean i failed at a lot of things i've tanked a couple of companies whatever but i don't i don't think we should embrace failure but i think we should um understand how we react to failure and what what that behavior should be you know i i will tell you the people who are always talking about embracing failure are the failures <laughs> right 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 I mean, have you ever noticed that yeah, uh, Elizabeth Holmes, hello yeah. like I right? never, I, yeah listen i never heard steve jobs or elon musk say it's okay to fail yeah I, I agree with that. You know what? I'm so because I talk to so many people who are like, just fail. <laughs> you know, embrace it. Let's all fail together. But I don't think failure should be a thing, right? Like, you know, it, it happens. I've done it. You've done it. Like we've all failed in some capacity. But it's not a goal, right? Like failure yeah. is not a goal. No. Um, 
No, it's not a <laughs> either. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so can we move into, we only have, we have seven more minutes before we need to go into the Q&A section. And first of all, Guy, I appreciate your, your graciousness and your open, authentic, you're, you're always this way. Um, but let's talk about the art of, of perseverance and what, what that means. And you have 11 tenets that you go through. The first one, which you touched on is you, you said it's a marathon, not a race, but actually in your in your podcast, you said it's a decathlon, not a race. Yeah. Like, like what, what does that mean? Well, you know, I think many people think entrepreneurship is a sprint that, you know, you got to get to market, you got to fail fast, you have to prototype and all that. But well, what I think you realize is that you – it is a marathon in the sense that you ship version one of your product. It's going to be wrong. Then you have to ship one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, one, five. And, you know, Macintosh shipped in 1984. I don't think you could call it a success till maybe 2000. You know, it, it took that long. And Rumi, we thought it would be successful. You know, we shipped it in January of 1984. We thought, you know, worst case, it would be March of 1984 before it's a success. So, yeah, we're roughly 16 and a half years off. Uh, so and now the reason why I bring in the concept of uh, decathlon as opposed to marathon, a marathon implies that there's only one skill, distance running. Right. And that's not true of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship means a decathlon in the sense that it's not just distance running, it's pole vaulting, it's discus, it's hurdles, it's, you know, I don't, I don't even know what the 10 events are in a decathlon. But so entrepreneurship it is not a single event. Entrepreneurship means you have to raise money, hire people, make the product, support the product, market the product, revise the product, deal with your investors, deal with regulators. I mean, it's a lot of skills. It's not yeah. single-handed. Yep, exactly. All right, so let's move right on down to your cash, surviving yeah. the inventory thing. So that's the second tenet that you have in the art of perseverance. So talk, talk me through that. Yeah, so, you know, at the end of the day, you have to pay your bills, you have to pay your employees, and you can only pay them with cash. Um, now, you could, there's a nuance on that that's later in the art of perseverance, which is, you can give employees stock to compensate them, which doesn't affect your cash balance. But I think, you know, many, many businesses, they need to get over this thing like, okay, we got inventory, but if we start discounting it, it's going to ruin our margin. It's going to ruin our image. You know, that yeah. we never discounted this purse. We never discounted this gizmo. We never discounted before. And now people are going to think we're cheapening the brand. Well, guess what? The worst thing you can do for your brand is die. So if if I were you, I'd be worried about cash, and and not be worried about the, the sort of the brand image. Uh, there there are brand new iPad Pros that were just announced a couple months ago that today are discounted on Amazon. So trust me if I tell you, if Apple has products that's discounted on Amazon, brand new stuff you can discount your products too. Yeah, yeah, you wrote about that. That, that was a, a, a big part of this um, particular blog and podcast. So, okay, let's talk about your thing on um, do business directly with your customers. Yeah. You know, I think right now, like going through the pandemic or the pando, as my daughters call it, uh, this is a really important topic. And, yeah. you know, can you walk us through that? Yeah. So basically, um, it, this is kind of the flip side of cash is king. So cash is king. Um, and one of the ways you can increase your gross margin is to cut out multiple tiers of distribution. So, you know, like if, you're, if your widget costs 20 bucks and you can discount it and sell it for 10, um, you used to sell it at $10 to your distributor or your retailer, now you're selling it direct to the consumer. Well, in one sense, what do you care? I mean, if you get 10 bucks from Joe Blow or you get 10 bucks from Amazon, it's 10 bucks. So yeah. get the 
10 bucks. Now, the reason why I say you do business direct is because there are definite logistical limitations and Amazon may decide that your product isn't essential. So it's not qualifying for Amazon Prime or yeah, they may have reduced staff. So nobody's at shipping receiving to get your widget to, to resell or God help you if you have inventory at your reseller, but now they have limited staff to package and ship and sell. So, you know, wh why take a chance with all those variables happening? Just sell direct. So when you're, let, let me just go off script a little bit here, but when, when you're working with startups, and I know you, you do a lot with startups and you're a big advocate for um, entrepreneurship and the startup economy and, and the, the creative economy, how do you coach people into that mindset? Like, I, I, it's hard. It's hard to get from, you know, like knowing something that you know and you just can't unknow it into thinking about new ways of problem solving. Like, how do you, how do you, how do you coach that? Uh, my experience throughout life is a near death experience, assuming it doesn't kill you, is an excellent learning opportunity. So, um, you know, right, right now, if you're a small business, and let's take the worst case. You're a small business. You are doing business indirect. You are preserving your channel integrity. You, you never discounted. You know, you did all this kind of stuff. You, you, your supply chain, you, you were always after the lowest cost of goods sold. So your supply chain stretched from middle America all the way to Taiwan or, you know, right. someplace in China. And now there's a trade war with China. No boats are coming from China. Oh. You can't sell indirectly. Amazon doesn't want to stock your product, doesn't want to sell it. So now, guess what? I mean, assuming you don't die, you're going to learn to do business with a different supply chain. You're going to learn to do business directly. You're going to learn that maybe you don't want 25 thing, 25 SKUs in your product line. The, I, I, I'll tell you right now, as a shopper, so we're sheltering in place. We've been in the house for about two months now. Um, I have not been to a store in literally two months. And the other day I went to the post office for 10 minutes. That's the only time I've been outside, you know, in, a, in an institution like that where I encountered strangers in the last two months. And so one of the things is, you know, now we use Instacart for all our groceries. Yeah, yeah. And you know, before you wanted to go to a Safeway or you wanted to go to a Draeger's or you wanted to go to a Sagona's where I live. And there were six kinds of oranges, seven kinds. There was, you know, there was the, the Fuji sure. apple, yes. the Nitro Crisp apple, the, you know, the Monterey apple, the whatever. And I got to tell you, now you're on Instagram, uh, Instagram, you're on Instacart and you say, I want apples. And they say, okay, we got Fuji apples. Ah, Fuji apples are fine. And they get a text message from Instacart, you know, from Mario, the Instacart guy who's now in Safeway. And he says, they don't have, well, they don't have Fuji apples. We want apple sauce instead. Like the other day, literally, literally, I placed an order for fresh corn on the cob because I wanted corn on the cob. And the Instagram guy sends me a text message. And I wasn't there, so I didn't say yes or no. So I ordered corn on the cob. And when he delivers it, I ask him, where's the corn on the cob? Because there was no corn on the cob. But I got you six corn, six cans of canned corn. <laughs> you know, I mean, can you get mad at that? I mean. Yeah. No, it's all awesome. right? So yeah. I guess I'm saying that you know, I think that people's expectations are different. That, you know, yeah, ultimately, I would like the organic non-gmo smooth style peanut butter but if you don't have any peanut butter in stock freaking give me the chunky skippy I don't know. yeah i mean it, it is so interesting from a psychological and a demographic you know like just what is going on right now um and how it plays into the 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 psychology of yeah. business i mean it is just fascinating to me okay but we're back to you Back to you, guy. Um, so tap your installed base. Talk, talk us through that, that point. Well, tapping your installed base means that assuming you have a good product and you're treating people well, 
the easiest people in the world to sell to are the people you've already sold to before, right? You're not overcoming resistance, overcoming ignorance, all that. Hopefully you have kept their email address. And so, I mean, this, this sort of all ties together. So you, you simplify your product line. You have, instead of 25 SKUs, you have five. And you reach out directly to your customer base through their email or whatever it is, and you sell them direct. I mean, what else are you going to do? And right. theoretically, your install base got the, the gadget, the gizmo from you before and likes it and is willing to do business with you again, not buying through Amazon this time, but buying direct and with a humongous discount. So what's wrong with that? No, I mean, it's logical. I mean, Barack is on now. Are you going to cut us off? Because I have one more, I have one more question. Um, and then is that okay, Barack? It like it's it's important. Sure, that, Amy, please go ahead. Yeah, guy, I'm sorry, but this one really hit home for me. Yeah. Don't rely on politicians. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk through that one, shall we? Yeah. You know, how, how, how deep you want do you want me to go? Because yeah. By the way, that's my puppy dog. That's Ranger. Um, I think go as deep as you want to go because this to me, like especially where we are right now, historically, uh, is re it, it, it really resonates with a lot of people. Like nobody knows what the shit to do anymore, like with what we've got to deal with. And um, I, I thought it was very brave of you to include this in the art. <laughs> I, I, really, I really did. And so I just wanted to hear you. And we're not going to get through all 11 of your tenants, but for anybody who wants to know them, Go and look at the podcast, The Art of, of Perseverance. All right, sorry, over to you. So, so basically, um, we are having a medical issue. Don't, right don't, now. don't hold back, okay? okay? Let's go next here. Let's like, let's we, are, we are having a medical issue, not a political issue. And this virus is not Republican and it's not Democrat, it's not conservative, it's not liberal. It is a virus. It, it's not even a thinking animal. It's its entire job is to invade and replicate. And you are either a host or you're not a host, okay? So it seems to me that, listen, what, what I mean, this is kind of an IQ test. If you cannot breathe, are you gonna call your politician for advice? I mean, how stupid can you be? So, <laughs> If your politician says, yeah, it's okay, you know, go go out and eat in a restaurant, go to a, you know, go to a soccer match with a hundred thousand of your closest coughing and sneezing friends, it's okay. I mean, that just doesn't pass the sniff test. You don't want to get this virus. Right. And so, I, like, why would you listen, listen to a politician? Uh, I just, yeah, I would listen, I would listen. Although, uh, you know, I, uh, this piece of advice is a little tarnished now because <laughs> whenever I had a medical ailment, the only place I trusted on the Internet was the Mayo Clinic, right? Because I know the Mayo Clinic, they're not white nationalist Nazis who are trying to you know, foster a political agenda. Mayo Clinic is science. Now, the reason why I had a little bit of a conniption just saying that is because I think it was so stupid for them to let Pence walk around without a mask yeah. in the minute. That was I, on, on the scale of stupidity. Now, I understand that maybe they get hundreds of millions of dollars of grants from the federal government. So if you piss off Pence, you know, he might call somebody in the Department of Housing or, you know, human services and tell them not to give Mayo Clinic the hundreds of millions of dollars. I can understand that. But if, if I were CEO of the Mayo Clinic and Pence said, no, I'm not going to wear a mask. And of course, the reason he gives is so freaking stupid. So the reason he gives is I cannot wear a mask because I want to look these patients in the eye to foster sincerity. Well, let me tell you something, Pence. You don't look with your mouth and your nose. The mouth doesn't cover your eyes. So anyway, so, so I, I, we're going down this rat hole. So the bottom line is, if there was one person in the world I would listen to, it's Fauci. That's it. That's it. 
And you could make the case that at the national scale in the United States, whatever the highest people in the United States and federal government say, do the opposite. You'll be safe. And on that note, Barack, so I, do you want to take some questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to change the topics because uh, our, most of the audience are startups and entrepreneurs. They have many questions. But uh, off the topic, uh, one of the uh, earlier questions was you were uh, like looking 40s. What to eat? What do you do to uh, be uh, uh, such? Uh, <laughs> you know, um, I'm sorry. Is that for me or is that for Guy? It just for yes, me. yes, Amy. Both you, please answer both of you. No, I'm kidding. Oh. Oh, hey, Amy, Amy looks 25, not 40. Let's not insult Amy. Um, oh, stop it. So, you know, I think it's a lot to do with the quality of my wife. Uh, so, li wife, W-I-F-E, not life, wife. So that's number one. Um, I, I, you know, I'm a lucky guy. I have a really good camera. I have really good lighting. I have a really good backdrop. Um, I, I, I am 65 years old, and I have four children. My children are, let's see, 27, 25, 18, and 15, and they are the light of my life. Um, I'm not a billionaire. I'm not like Sheryl Sandberg kind of quality. But I'm not living paycheck to paycheck either. So I have the ability to sort of pick and choose. Um, I, I, you know, I make, I make most of my money speaking, uh, although there are no speeches anymore. <laughs> I tried to get them to pay for this, but no, they wouldn't do that. Uh, so there's that. And, and then, you know, Canva, Canva, everybody listening should use Canva for their graphics. And Canva, uh, let me describe what I call Guy's Golden Touch. So Guy's Golden Touch is not whatever I touch turns to gold. The implication being that, you know, I have some magic touch that makes everything successful. Guy's Golden Touch is whatever is gold Guy touches. So uh, Canva is gold, so I touched it. But can I, can I just add something, Guy, because I sure. know you and we've, you know, I, I, I've interviewed you on several occasions, but... I mean, one of the things that is so inspiring about your work is that you do what you love. You are, you are, you have a calling, um, and you write, and you speak, and you talk, and you have words of inspiration. And I think it, like, maybe that's why you look like you're 28 years old. I don't know. Just throwing it out there, just being honest. I would actually say I think it's more accurate. Um, it's it, there. There's two ways of looking at it. So one is you you do what you love, but I will also say that I don't do what I don't love. That's right. Yep. Which is maybe just as important, if not more. I agree. More. I agree. Like I just refuse then, to do shit that I don't want to do. No, you're not doing that. Then following up question. Yeah. Uh, why did you Why did you leave law school and? When should founders quit? I mean, how? Yeah. So I left law school because I couldn't handle it. I was just miserable. It was too intimidating. I totally wimped out. Um, having said that, that was one of the smarter decisions that I made because most people are lawyers for 25 years and then they discover they're miserable. I discovered that after 25 days. So, uh, yeah, so that that's why I quit law school. Thank God I quit law school. Um, what, what was the second part of the question? When should uh, the founders quit and how oh, can oh. understand the point yeah. that has to be quit? Okay, so uh, this is a very difficult question to answer because um, much of management, the body of knowledge of management is anecdotal. So, you know, there are anecdotes that... Um, this entrepreneur really believed in his product or her product and you know, it wasn't doing well, it was crappy and everybody told them to quit and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But this person believed and persevered and you know, just before the company was about to die, the order came in and it turned everything around. So that's the stick with it. 
There's also the theory of, you know, don't be stupid. Don't push a, a boulder up a hill. If the market is telling you it sucks, pivot and change. And there are stories about that too. So the question is, which story do you believe? <laughs> there is no answer to that because for every story of sticking with it, I can give you a story of pivoting. And it's, there is no science about this, right? So there's no science where we say, okay, let's take two equally qualified people in two equal companies and we'll just control one variable, which is then change the product to another product or not. You cannot do that scientific test. Right. They're in large problems. So, you know, what happens, and I've written 15 books. I'll tell you what happens is the writer, the author, has a theory. The theory is you should pivot, or the theory is you should not pivot. And then what you do is you go find evidence to support your theory. So I want to prove that you should pivot. I'll go find five examples of great pivots. They started in service, you ended up in a product, you started with a product, you ended up in the service, and I'm going to write these five stories down, and I'm going to prove to you that pivoting works. That, that is totally not scientific. That's like, yeah. I had the conclusion, I went to find the data to support it. That's not how science works. That's how American politicians work. That's not how science works. And also, what motivates you to work, by the way? I'm sorry? What motivates you to work? Oh, I still have two tuitions to pay. That's what motivates me to work. Anybody who tells you, I work for the sheer pleasure of increasing knowledge in the universe and bringing joy to people and all that, it's all the bullshit. It's all the bullshit. <laughs> If if I didn't have these bills, I would not be working. <laughs> and uh, I be, so I would be surfing every day. You you interrupted my surf session today. I mean, I, you know that in a perfect world, I'd still be surfing. <laughs> Where did you learn surfing in Hawaii, or when did you learn? Which age did you I, learn I, surfing? I I kind of took up surfing both in Santa Cruz and Hawaii. I started about five years ago. And um, you should definitely not wait till you're 60 to start surfing. That is 55 <laughs> years too late. So uh, let's uh, then sum up uh, the several questions and close this session uh, for the surf uh, sake. And uh, the uh, startups are asking, how are we going to... Uh, how are we going to survive in these outbreak times? Because there are lots of uh, recommendations from the ed uh, coaches, advisors, and mentors, but they wanted to also know your opinion about, um, of course, we have watched your video and listened to podcasts about um, uh, surviving tips, but uh, should you uh, give some hints about uh, how to survive longer periods in these times or yeah, but... how to uh, find investors? in these times you know what so every tip i have about surviving is in the podcast and in the youtube video so you know just look up the art of perseverance in remarkablepeople.com or you know on youtube there's a video about it also so that's right. every tip i have for surviving the pandemic now how to raise capital right now man i i, I you know i don't want to tell you it's impossible but it is. I mean, I, 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 I you know, I suppose if if you were Mark Zuckerberg and you said I'm I'm leaving Facebook and I'm starting another company, you, you would raise capital. Kiner Perkins and Sequoia would be happy to fund you. Although, if you're Mark Zuckerberg, why you have to raise capital is 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 a logical question. So. Like right now, I think it would be very, it's, listen, at all times, it's very difficult. Even in the best of times, it's very difficult to raise money uh, from venture capital. So now in a pandemic, you know, take the difficulty and multiply it by 100. And so I, I think that you should view venture capital as an absolute last resort you know, it's 
if you wake up one day and you say, okay, I might raise venture capital or I might get struck by lightning, I would say getting struck by lightning is more likely, even if the sky is blue. So I don't want to like shake you up and depress you, but you know, venture capital raising, I think right now is very difficult. And yes, you are going to hear anecdotes about such and such raise $5 million and $10 million and all that. But the reason why you're hearing that story is because nobody else did it. Yeah. So uh, you, you have got to develop a business model that is capital, venture capital free. Um, and, and I also, you know, it's very important for people to understand that venture capital is a very special kind of funding. It's not for a restaurant. It's not for a store. It's not for a consultancy. It's not for a book. It's not for, you know, some kind of new kind of uh, knife sharpening. It's not for a new iPhone case. It's not for that kind of stuff. Venture capital is to create the next Salesforce, the next Apple, the next Facebook, the next Pinterest, the next Instagram. That's the venture capital game. So if you think, wow, you know, I, I make just the best hummus in all of Turkey. So I'm going to raise venture capital because I'm going to have hummus.com. Ain't going to happen because hummus.com is not going to be a billion dollar organization. So, you know, venture capital is a very special game. The last question, you have written lots of books. And uh, in these uh, two months lockdown days, have you uh, ever, I mean, uh, how many books have you read and uh, do you recommend new books? And <laughs> you are mentioning on Vice Guy that a book has changed your life. Uh, yeah. Should you also mention that? Yeah. So the book that changed my life is a book called uh, If You Want to Write by Brenda Eulen. So everybody should read that book. Now, you're not all writers, but... It, it has to do with any kind of creative or entrepreneurial effort. So if you want to program, if you want to cook, if you want to make movies, if you want to write, if you want to sing, you know, anything like that, just substitute the verb. So that's the book. Um, but what was the first question? Like my, my <laughs> attention. Oh my God. That's why she should never two months. What was the first part? Uh, the, the first part is in last two months, uh, which oh, new books writer. have you read? Yes. Yeah. So um, I, I read books. I skim books in order to prepare for my podcast, right? So recently, for example, I interviewed Steven Pinker, who's a Harvard psychologist. So I had to read Steven Pinker's book. Uh, I read, a, I interviewed someone who was interned, Japanese American who was interned during World War II. So I had to read her book, Farewell to Manzanar. So uh, for every podcast, you have to do a lot of research in order to ask intelligent questions. So if you looked at my podcast, you can kind of figure out which books I read. It would be books written by those people. Um, but I, I never read nonfiction for fun or for interest. Uh, and let me tell you why. Um, I figure if I read a nonfiction business book and it's better than my book, I will get depressed. <laughs> and, and if it's worse than my book, it wasted my time. So there's no upside. <laughs> so I never read nonfiction. I do read fiction. Now, having said that, you know, the kind of fiction I read is always about. Um, uh, some U.S. Navy SEAL, he was retired with his wife and daughter. The wife and daughter got killed in a terrorist attack. He goes on a drug and alcohol binge. His life has fallen apart. One day he hears helicopters above his house. He goes outside. Secret Service is there. They, they pull him off. They say, okay, get in the helicopter. He gets in the helicopter. They land at the White House lawn. They go into the White House. He sees the president, and the president says that the CIA, FBI, you know, Joint Chiefs of Staff, they cannot control terrorism. Here's the presidential pardon in advance. I want you to just go out and just kill terrorists. 
I don't care about due process. I don't care about law. Just kill them all. He goes home back in the helicopter. He presses a button on his wall. This closet opens up, and there's like automatic weapons there's grenade launchers there's stinger missiles there's all this stuff and he goes out and he starts killing bad guys so that's basically the plot of every book that i read scary but true <laughs> can i just brock can i just say one more yes, thing please yeah, you know, sort of like dovetailing off of what guy is talking about the, the the most important thing for all founders and entrepreneurs and you know startups whatever whatever you are is is to read and to not read just one kind of book if you just read business books it's like eating one food for the rest of your life you need to have a a a, a diet that is varied right like read nonfiction read history read all of these things are going to make you a better leader um, but if you just if if and I don't. I mean, no disrespect um, by saying this, but I guess I kind of do since I'm saying it. Um, but if you, only, if you only read Malcolm Gladwell, you will only be able to um, affect the Malcolm Gladwell theories. So go out there and read, like, read, right? I mean, just well, but, read shit. But Amy, you know, that's also true of Guy Kawasaki. If you only read Guy Kawasaki books. Hey man. I read your books, but I read other stuff too. I've read every single book, but I'm telling you, Enchantment, I think it's because you signed it for me. Like, it, it kind of sp spoke to me. But I, I can know. find more books for you. But you <laughs> know what? You know, honestly, um, I, put more en I put more energy into my podcast than writing. Yeah. I think podcast yeah. is a better yeah. medium. Great, like I, your work has never been more important than it is right now, guy. Like, and I the, seriously, if people, if you if you go and listen to one of guys' podcasts, it, it's like it's like Game of Thrones. Like, you cannot stop. You cannot stop. And I spent you know three hours last night at midnight, like listening. Like, it it is that good. So anyway, Brock, sorry, I didn't mean to. No, for, Brock, for, for the. For the entrepreneurs in particular watching this, if you had to only listen to one of my podcasts, it would probably be Steve Wozniak. Steve Wozniak explains the start of Apple. And let's just say the start of Apple is not about MBAs and analysis and market projections and all that. It's because Woz wanted an Apple one. So you need to understand how Apple started. And then if you want to listen to a second podcast, it's by Bob Cialdini. And Bob Cialdini is the godfather of influence and persuasion. Mm -hmm. So his podcast explains how to persuade people to change their minds, buy your products, et cetera, et cetera. Amy, Guy, thank you very much for this valuable time and for this awesome yeah. interview. Uh, we are excited to host you in you this know, unique uh, uh, I've, been to, I've, been to, I've been to Istanbul several times. I love Istanbul. I mean, oh my God, that is such an interesting country. And I love the Grand Bazaar. I just think that is what you call commerce, man. That is, that's how you do business. And the last time I was there, I spoke for uh, Turkcell. And so in the speech, I said, you know, does anybody, is anybody here, can you get me on the roof of the Grand Bazaar where they made Skyfall? <laughs> and and, and Turkcell did it because I guess there's a lot of antennas on the Grand Bazaar, right? So they got me on the roof. And so I have pictures of me standing on the roof with the mosque behind me. And I call that Guyfall. So... <laughs> Thank you, and um, have a great time with the surfing. Uh, we, are, we are very jealous about uh, surfing time. I mean, uh, we are locked down in Istanbul here. But uh, thank you very much, Amy and Guy, again. And hope to see you both physically, hopefully, when these <laughs> outbreak completes. And we will be happy to welcome you in Istanbul again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. bye.